Minister Cook, thank you and um, welcome everyone. Uh, how many of you do not live in New York City? Good, well, let me have one request. Before you leave, spend some money. We need the sales tax and um, let me talk to you for a couple minutes about New York, what you see when you go outside. Uh, 40%, four out of every, two out of every five people that you see walking by that lives in New York were born outside of the United States. New York is one of the most diverse cities in the world, but more importantly, unlike other diverse cities, New York lives as a mixture rather than as a mosaic. So in other cities, you will have neighborhoods where a particular ethnic or economic group would live. In New York City, there's very little of that. Every block will have multiple ethnicities, multiple economic levels, multiple levels of education, and multiple uses of buildings. So you can see residential and retail and commercial and industrial all in the same block. You can go down the street, if you go to Queens, for example, and you will see signs in Russian and Korean and Spanish and Urdu and English all on the same block. It is very different and the reason I mention it is when New Yorkers walk down the steps to the subway or stand in line to buy a newspaper or a cup of coffee, they're very likely to be standing next to somebody who is very different than them. And after a period, those people don't become threatening. So New Yorkers have accepted each other in a very unique ways. I can't tell you that everybody's friendly with everybody else, but you see virtually no discrimination based on ethnicity. You have virtually no racial problems or tensions here. And it is very different. And um, I would urge you to try to get around New York uh, a little bit before you leave, not just Manhattan. Uh, we probably have more people living in New York City than live from your country than live in the second largest city in your country. Now that's probably not true with China or India or a country that size, but most other countries that really is true. And the cultural institutions that they brought, the impact on our language and our cuisine uh, really makes this city, America too, but this city more than other places, a real melting pot. Anyways, it's a, uh, an honor to host you, uh, all of the members and guests of the Club de Madrid. Uh, we are proud of our reputation as the world's second home. Uh, two days ago, if you were here, uh, I was honored to start and to hold the tape at the finish of the New York City Marathon. We had something like 45,000 people cross the finish line. Uh, Minister Cook was thrilled to know it was sponsored by ING, a Dutch bank, so I was sure to wear all my orange colors that day. Uh, but people came from 135 nations to run through the streets of our city. And um, I'm delighted to welcome you here for what I assume will be a little bit less strenuous, but equally international gathering. Uh, let me also mention that I was delighted to hear that at your 10th anniversary dinner tomorrow night, uh, you'll honor someone who has chosen to make this city as his base of international action, and that is former President Bill Clinton. Uh, like many of you, I have had the pleasure of working with President Clinton for a long time, uh, most recently because I chair the C40 Climate Leadership Group, which brings some of the world's major cities together to address climate issues. And President Clinton has made a global climate change a strong focus of his work, and he cooperates very closely with us. And I never fail to be impressed with the amazing scope of his knowledge, his tremendous energy and the sense of hope and optimism he brings to our efforts. So I wholeheartedly enjoy you, join you in applauding President Clinton. Uh, he really has worked hard to make our world a better, freer place. And incidentally, you can tell him I said hello. He'll get a kick out of that. Um, I also want to commend the Club de Madrid for the issue you've chosen to focus on today, and that is digital technologies and the future of governance in the 21st century. I don't think there could be a more important or more timely subject for your work. Every day, uh, events in every part of the world show us how the internet and social media are dramatically transforming the way people engage with their governments and one another. 
Uh, some governments have tried to close off the new public spaces created by social media, but have discovered just how difficult that is. And uh, perhaps everyone who's committed to democratic principles should welcome this communications revolution because the free flow of information and ideas is the very lifeblood of a democratic society. And that was true back when the printing press was discovered. And it's equally as true with Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. I will say, however, that governing is going to be very different. In the past, people ascended to power through election or uh, death or revolution, a variety of different ways, and they went out the same ways. But fundamentally, between going into power and leaving power, there was very limited ability for the public to interface and to impact how whoever was in charge governed. Today, with social media, there is a virtual referendum on every single thing every few minutes. And it really, I think, is going to change how we govern. And it's not clear to me how democracy works as well when everything you do is, has to stand the test of the immediacy rather than being viewed in the longer term. It will be a great challenge for all of us. In New York City, we've certainly adopted technology. Uh, we have a website, nyc.gov. Uh, we had, when I came into office, something like 12 pages of 2,000 phone numbers per page for New York City agencies. We combined it all into one phone number, 311, or actually two, because it's a 911 emergency number. We've made all of the different agencies use the same website, nyc.gov, because it's, the public does not have a ways to find out where they should go. It's our obligation to make them be able to get to our agencies that need help. And social media channels and newsletters from city agencies also help. We even have a competition for applications that show off what New York does and give better access to our city. Uh, we put di digital media to work in a variety of ways of approving city services. When New Yorkers encounter, for example, a faulty traffic signal or a leaky hydrant or a pothole, uh, we we asked them to just call 311 or send us digital photos of the problems they're reporting. And we assign them a tracking number so they can go and see how quickly we repair or fix or replace or whatever. Uh, and uh, it gives me the opportunity to look at an agency and know how well they do. Because for the first time, the information is there of who asked for something and when we provided that service. And I can hold our commissioners much more accountable than in the olden days where the information wasn't available. And in any case, it was not in digital form. Uh, we've made the city government work better, uh, more efficiently, more accountable. I think you see that. And uh, we have record low crime. We have a record high high life expectancy because we've stopped smoking in many cases. We reduced the deaths by fires. We reduced the deaths by traffic accidents, all these to record lows, using technology to find out where the problems were and then to devote our resources to making those things better. Uh, and we are using it also to try to diversify our economy. Uh, we were very susceptible to a downturn in the financial sector. New York is a very big financial sector, the biggest in the United States by far. But we have tried to diversify our economy so that when Wall Street doesn't do well, we still have jobs for people and a tax base. And so today, I think it's fair to say we are the fashion capital of the world. We have double the number of fashion houses here that exist in Paris. We are the film capital of the United States. Hollywood is probably about the same size, but the trend is clear. Producers are moving their movie making to New York, where it all started, incidentally. They're moving it to New York from Canada, where they escaped a while ago, or to Eastern Europe. Uh, we've worked very hard to make this a digital media capital of the world and, a, and an IT capital. In fact, we have a request from, and, and we've got seven good uh, uh, so, um, proposals we've got to pick from, to have major universities in the United States open new campuses in applied science here in New York. Because if you look, the new companies are all being born by kids getting out of college, and they typically stay where they went to school. So Palo Alto, California, where Stanford is, for example, has an enormous number of companies that are there for only one reason, 
That's where the founder went to school. There's a lot of jobs involved. We want those jobs here in the city. So we've made a proposal, and Stanford's actually one of the schools that's trying to win the competition to open a new uh, campus here in New York, which will create more jobs for our people. We have 8.4 million people, a record number. Uh, we have 50 million tourists coming to our city this year. Tourism is the industry that we've chosen to replace the old manufacturing businesses that have gone elsewhere. Uh, tourism offers entry-level jobs, which is the typical level that our unemployed are, so it really has been a godsend for us. And because of the diversity of our city, tourism is relatively easy uh, as an easy industry to promote around the world. People want to come and see where their friends move to. And uh, it is just um, it's a very big part of our tax base. So I've always been a very big pro-immigration person. I know uh, in many countries it's controversial. It's controversial in a lot of parts of the United States. Uh, but I'll give you just two numbers, and then I'll uh, have to go. Uh, and you've heard enough from me, other than I just really came to welcome you. I didn't mean to go on like this. But when this recession hit, uh, the United States lost 6% of its private sector jobs. New York City, which is the most diverse city in the country, with far and away the most immigrants, both documented and undocumented, we lost 0.3% of our jobs. And I would attribute the difference mainly to the diversity of our uh, population. Uh, immigrants create jobs rather than take them away. Immigrants do things that other people aren't willing to work. Immigrants set an example for those who've been here, and I think it would probably be true in every one of your countries, uh, for a number of generations. We all get complacent. We all get lazy. Uh, people that uh, have voted with their feet to try something new are anything but lazy. They're a good example for all of us. And I think uh, I can't speak for any other country, but uh, I have uh, given speeches uh, virtually every couple of weeks uh, trying to get our government to uh, open up the borders and bring more immigrants here. So if you have anybody that uh, is tired and poor or whatever Lazarus says in the Statue of Liberty, send them here. We want them. We also want your dollars shop in New York City. Thank you for everyone.